if you want more with a man, don't do this. It's so important to understand how the male mind works in terms of you being friends and what a real breakup needs to look like so that a man is inspired to want you in the full way you want him. In this episode with Logan, you will hear the missteps she makes with Will and you don't want to make them. So listen and learn what to do instead so that you inspire a man to get back with you in the full way you desire and deserve. So let's get right to this episode with Logan. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach for women, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. I coach you to find a potential Mr. Right, get an ex back, or grow an existing relationship with a man you truly desire, and learn how to inspire his continued interest for the relationship of your dreams, so that you level up to the complete commitment you totally deserve. My guest today is 45-year-old divorced mom, Logan, who is in an email pen pal lover situationship with 44-year-old divorced dad, Will. Logan and Will are in touch by Will emailing Logan lengthy messages daily and occasional texts, but due to mismatched parenting schedules and not wanting to involve their children in their relationship, there is little to no in-person contact. There are two nights during the week that they could see each other, but due to Will's lack of initiative, Logan has stopped her invites. Logan worries that Will's fear of failure following his divorce isn't allowing him to move on despite their chemistry and great friendship. After every extended time together, after extended time together, Will has broken things off twice. Yet the two manage to get back to the low contact pen pal situationship they're in now. Logan is worried that if she cuts things off completely, she will ruin her chances with Will forever. She's also concerned about dating others while still in love with Will and wants my advice to help get unstuck. Welcome, Logan. Hi, Paula. I love hearing something in this introduction that was crafted by one of my assistants, and that is that you and Will are not involving your children in your relationship. I love hearing that. I think that is so important. So right off the bat, I'm giving you a thumbs up there. Honestly, it's one of the things that I value most in him. I feel like we have a solid shared um, sens sensibility of surrounding that. Great. How many children does he have and what are their ages? He has two. They are 11 and eight, I believe. And I have three sons who are 15, 13, and 11. My goodness, you must be seriously busy. Yeah, definitely. How long have you been divorced? I have been divorced for a little more than three years now and separated for more than four years. So altogether seven years or you were separated a year before your divorce? I was separated a year before my divorce was finalized. And to whatever degree you feel comfortable sharing, why are you divorced with children the ages that they are? Well, the, the marriage had disintegrated, I think, over the course. We were married for about 16 years. I was very young when we uh, met, and we dated for about five years prior to getting married. A person changes a great deal from young adulthood to middle age, and parenting certainly brings upon some of those changes. I would say that my ex and I grew apart. Uh, we're living very separate 
lives really didn't see each other very much despite cohabitating and partnering when it came to some things, I would say, but we really were ships in the night and I was carrying the load, all of the load with parenting while working full time and really didn't feel like I was getting support. And it just sort of drifted farther apart rather than coming back together despite attempts at working on it and and counseling and that sort of thing. I see. And how long has Will been divorced? I think he's been divorced uh, about three years as well. How did you meet? So we met through a professional association. Um, We knew each other through our respective jobs. And we were in touch off and on, I would say occasionally at most, um, but really didn't see each other very much at all in a professional setting. So ironically, the friendship, I guess, was started through occasional emails, which is <laughs> where we find ourselves today. Um, but we did be in that setting. And then I think kind of developed, um, I don't know, maybe just an understanding that we had kind of like similar interests. And then a friendship came from there. And through that friendship, realized that we were on similar trajectories with divorce and uh, parenting, single parenting, that kind of thing. So I think it was a very slow process of getting to know him and then realizing that maybe just maybe there was something more than just acquaintances and then friendship. So now that explains why the emails, and thank you for that, because it started out like that through business somehow, the emailing? Yeah. I see. And how long since you started something romantic? Uh, I don't know exactly, but we went on a first, I guess you could call it date. We met in person for the first time several months after we were both separated. So I don't know, like we first met, I don't know, like five, four or five years ago, something like that, but really didn't see each other very often and didn't meet again with intention till two, two and a half to about two and a half years ago. So take me through how it became a relationship, I assume at the start, meaning romantic at that time, two and a half years ago-ish. And to where things are now. Okay. So I think that um, we we were both surprised by um, a level of attraction that just seemed to, to develop organically um, to the point where I, I kind of pretended that it wasn't even happening, to be honest, because I felt like it just wasn't the right time. I was in the midst of finalizing a divorce and processing that and becoming a single mom and moving into a new home and all of that. And I just felt a little overwhelmed with those life changes. So I I have to be honest in that I kind of just ignored it for a little while, this growing sense of attraction or interest and curiosity towards him. He definitely pursued me before I gave him any attention back for a while, really. But it was kind of like a low pursuit. It wasn't intense, but he kept in contact. He would send, send things to me, articles and things that he thought might interest me and follow up. And he was pretty regular with reaching out to the point finally when he admitted that he had feelings or was developing a crush. He admitted that in person. We met up and he admitted that in in person. And I pulled back and, and said, well, I don't think I necessarily feel that way. I think pulled back and was quiet for a few days, didn't say anything. And then when I reflected upon it, decided that maybe I should be honest and got back in touch with him in the form of a written letter expressing that the feelings were in fact mutual. And I didn't really know what to do with those feelings, but I wanted him to know that he wasn't alone in them and the feelings he had for me were in fact reciprocal. So I don't remember exactly what happened when we finally got together, but shortly thereafter, we met in person. And I think we met in person several times without anything happening whatsoever, physical, just kind of like talking in person, which honestly felt pretty exciting because up to that point, it had just been written communication. And we get, got along very well, humor, interest, conversation, like the same things, found ourselves in similar situations. So there was a lot to connect on. It turned into over, I guess, the next few months, 
into going out on some dates and then became physical. And once that began, it was actually pretty intense. The chemistry was great. We looked forward to seeing each other. We were seeing each other maybe once a week, having phone calls maybe once or twice a week and continuing to be in touch through email. And it felt great. It felt like it was reciprocal. It was fun. It was exciting to have a relationship that felt really solid, honestly, and reciprocal because I hadn't had that for a long time. So that continued for about a year, maybe, yeah, about a year, to the point when we decided that we might go away for the weekend. We booked a hotel. I was the one who booked it. And just before that trip. It wasn't even real. It was just like a quick getaway. He had to bail out at the last minute because of a thing that came up with parenting. And I completely understood. I I know what it's like to have so many variables, especially as a single parent. Was not upset at all. Didn't react in a way that expressed any kind of disappointment other than like, oh, that's a bummer. I wish we could go. And a few days later, maybe a week later, he broke it off and said, I don't feel like I am in a place to be a reliable partner, boyfriend. There have been people in my life that have not come through for me and have had to bail out the last minute. I don't want to be that person. I don't think I can be reliable enough to be in a relationship and just ended it. So I was very upset. And I guess at the time I didn't, I wasn't as knowledgeable on some of the best practices in reacting to breakup. I felt like it was out of the blue. So I I did express um, sadness. I think I cried. I reached out and asked for further explanation. And he, he responded. He was good about talking things through with me, but he was firm with his decision. And so therefore, we didn't speak very much at all for probably three, four months after that until we ran into each other um, maybe three months later at a mutual friends event and things just kind of like instantaneously kicked back up again. We were happy to see one another and we wound up, I think, kissing that night, flirting and then kissing, but nothing else happened. And then maybe over the course of another month or so, we saw each other more often, communicated more often and started things back up again. So it became physical again. Everything was really kind of like back to the way that they were before. Everybody was, seemed happy. I was happy. And that lasted, the second round, I guess, if you will, lasted for about another year-ish, something like that. And then out of the blue, he broke it off again with very similar reasoning, saying that he felt like he needed to take time to focus on his kids. He needed to take time to focus on wellness. He did not feel like he had anything to give. And he was very worried and perhaps is still very worried that any relationship that he has will somehow damage his children or create stress in their lives. And I do understand to a degree, however, I feel like we have never ever involved the children. And I would hope that I have kind of like proven myself to be trustworthy in that respect. To me, it it feels like a logical thought that turned into perhaps an irrational fear on his part. However, once again, he remained firm. And this second breakup, we didn't talk for about a year, really. And I was kind of worried about him at first, especially because it was so sudden. And I was also very sad. And so I would reach out, I don't know, maybe like once every month. Sometimes it would go longer than that. And he was very distant at first, but then started to warm back up again. And I think at the time, I felt like it was better to have some sort of contact than none at all because I really, really did miss him and I really do care about him. In hindsight, I don't know if that was the best way to handle it, but that is the way I handled it. And then this past spring and summer, things kind of picked back up again. I started to notice a change in energy and a a little bit more of a regularity in communication and he was initiating conversation with me and, and it was all in email or mostly in email, I think. Maybe there were a few texts, but then he asked me on a date. We went on a date, an in-person date. It was wonderful. I didn't know how it was going to go, but it was just like falling right back into, you know, the chemistry and the care that existed before. And we went on several more in-person dates, did not have sex, still have, have not. And it's kind of ebbed again, you know, to the point where we are communicating every single day. He 
he emails me every single day. The text is becoming honestly more frequent as well. But there is a hesitation or a blockage to see me in person. I wonder if that is because of that same old fear that if he sees me in person, it will lead to a physical relationship uh, maybe a more frequent in-person relationship and he is afraid that maybe he can't deliver on a commitment. I really do think that that is the reason for his holding back, but I'm not positive because I'm a little fearful of having the conversation, to be honest. Thank you for that. Tell me, so that I'm clear, how much you actually talk. Meaning over the phone or in person? Yes, Maybe once every two weeks. Is that actually seeing each other? No, we have not seen each other for maybe a month and a half at this point. How long have you been broken up this time? Well, I guess since I, about a, a year, a little more than a year. Let me just clarify. You've been broken up for a year? We, I don't think, Paula, that we ever got back together again after the last breakup, which was more than a year ago. When we reconnected this summer and fall, it felt like two people who were very, very glad to see one another and who still have a lot of chemistry and care for one another, but it did not feel like we were restarting a relationship in the traditional sense. However, from that point, the communication intensified and became a daily thing, which sounds strange. <laughs> However, and I asked myself, why am I fulfilled by it to any extent? And I have sort of thought that I wouldn't be fulfilled by this situation with anyone else. I don't think I would be. I have listened to some of your podcasts and read your books since I have bonded with him and since I really do and like him and enjoy his company and enjoy communicating with him, it does feel exciting and fulfilling to communicate with him. Furthermore, I know that as a single mother of three children, I don't know that I have a tremendous capacity right now for a relationship. I would ultimately like to have a committed relationship, but when I say ultimately, I think it could be years down the line. I do stand by it. I do believe it, that I, I would like to reduce that stress in my children's lives. And I feel very busy and very consumed by work and friendships and um, mothering. So I think that that's where part of the problem lies. Am I settling or am I taking um, an opportunity to have something that might be non-traditional but also makes me very happy? That's sort of the struggle. And as I say that, I do know that it's not okay to be relegated to email. It's okay to have email communication, but it's not okay to be relegated to it. And I think he knows that too. And I think he feels a little guilty about it, but I also think he doesn't know how to get past it, the fear or the overwhelm or the feelings of guilt or inadequacy, whatever it is. It feels like we're stuck in a situation that isn't ideal for either one of us, but the alternative would be nothing at all. I'm trying to figure out whether nothing at all in the time that we have right now is the best way to lead to something down the line. Or if I cut it off, does nothing at all mean nothing ever? Okay. So I assume you got in touch with us because it's getting to a point where there is some dissonance for you and questioning about what you are doing, if it is good for the future or negative for the future. That is correct. I do feel like there is a dissonance. I wonder how I can reconcile having such a strong relationship with someone that is maybe fearful to see me. Also have listened to some of your podcasts on low contact, being in the friend zone, and I, I know that your theory is that it never works out, so I'm just not sure what to do because, yes, that dissonance exists. So it's not really that you're not sure what to do. It's that it's painful to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because he has filled a very serious void for you for a long time. Yes. 
I know that I would miss him. I wouldn't just miss having a person on the other end of the line, so to speak. I would miss him as I have missed him in the past. And I am fearful of losing that connection for sure. And to go one step beyond it, I wonder sometimes if there are different rules or nuances that should be considered for people in our situations where we know we want relationships down the line, but we also don't feel like that's feasible right now because of life circumstances, and yet we have found a person with whom we connect very strongly. What do you do? Do you wait it out or do you cut it off and take a chance and see what happens? What I'm hearing you say is that you believe that to have a chance down the road you must continue with something in the present in whatever form that takes. Is that true? I, I'm not sure if I, if I know what to believe, but I, I'm fearful of taking the risk of not continuing it. And if you had to tell me why that is, what do you think is the reason? Hmm. Well, I guess on the surface level, I, I do worry that if I stop reaching out that he will resign himself to it quote unquote not being in the cards or him not being good enough or whatever and, and he will just accept it and, and let things fall by the wayside. I, I do worry about that. And I don't know if that's rational or irrational, but I do worry about that. And on a broader scale, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I think I feel uh, very happy that I have met someone who seems to value me for me. It's, um, I have not been in many relationships. But in my former marriage and in the times that we have been broken up, I have tried to date and I have gone on some dates. I just sometimes feel like um, the people I meet and wind up dating want a situation more than they or they want them. They want a person to fill a role that they have created in their mind rather than wanting me or wanting to take the time to get to know me. And I have felt that with this current situation, we value each other and really like one another. It's almost like the person came before the idea of the relationship. And I like that because neither one of us is really looking for a relationship. We just connected and found each other. In almost every situation or relationship I've been otherwise or dates, it very much feels like the man wants me for a generic company or a person to go on trips with or arm candy or whatever the case may be. And so with Will, I felt like and still do feel like I have met a person who really likes me and values me for me. So the reciprocity that exists there feels so strong and so good that it almost makes up for the lack of reciprocity in, in other ways. And that's how I think I've gotten myself into the situation. What is he showing you he wants you for in his life? Companionship, conversation, shared humor, shared interest, a, a, a friend, which I think is very important. I mean, we are very good friends. I just and, and I think in addition to that, there's an undeniable chemistry, but that part of it is being locked off right now. So whether or not he wants that, I'm not sure. I, it sort of feels like he does, but he's restraining himself because there is an element of flirtatiousness. And when we do see each other in person, there is a lot of chemistry. But what I think he feels like he can give me right now and what he probably wants for himself is a companion. And instead of being brave enough, I think, to push through the feelings of overwhelm and awkwardness of dating after divorce. I think he's, it's safe, I suppose. So I think both he and I do want the same things. It's just maybe I feel a little bit more comfortable and willing to take a chance on them right now. How is he showing you that he wants the same thing you do? Well, that's a good question, and it's one that illuminates maybe my own misconceptions. I don't know that he is. He Well, I think that he is showing me his capacity for consistency and care, but I don't think he's showing me um, that he wants a really, I'll, I'll put it this way, I, I have some questions as to what he really does want long term. So that's, it was good of you to ask that. You're right, he might not. I'm unclear on that. It's easy to be unclear when you are having daily contact. Yes. 
So it always begs the question, if you didn't have contact, would you be unclear? I would be unclear still on whether or not he wants it and is repressing it. One of the things that I I think both he and I do is make sacrifices because we think that um, we should be doing the quote-unquote right thing or the responsible thing. So one of my questions is, does he want something more but is too fearful of making that happen because he's afraid of his capacity or ability to give right now. I would hope that I would be able to instill a certain confidence in him. However, back to your point, I guess no contact does clear things up. I guess it gives a person an opportunity to really fight for what they want. So I'm going to answer your question because there was a question in there about if I cut it off, will he show me what he wants? That question is inherent in what you're talking about, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to clear it up for you by explaining something that's pretty fundamental. I'm going to explain it by two fundamentals, that when you understand these two things, you can start to create the change you're seeking to experience. And I want to do that when we come back. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be, because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future, in full, all ad-free. The 80-20 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status, and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, Relationship Evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. We're back with 45-year-old divorced mom, Logan. And thank you for outlining everything you did about your situationship with Will. Before break, I was explaining that I will outline for you two fundamentals that I think will really clear it up about why I believe the road you are taking is a road to being friend-zoned forever. Okay. If you've read my book, I think you have, and you've listened to the podcast, you likely know that men are about three things, challenge, competition, and conquering. Yes, I'm familiar with your book. And you are not giving Will any of those things. Yes, I I have been concerned about that, especially lately. Mm -hmm. You also have shown him that you will accept whatever from him. And that is against my worthy opponent concept. In other words, if you've heard it, you know that I talk about it under the realm of sports. And that is men like to play at their highest level possible. And with whatever they're doing in their life, work, advocation, women, if they're not challenged, they do not have much interest in playing. Yeah, I understand. So you were showing him that whatever he wants, you give him. That is not challenging and doesn't inspire him to play the game of romance, so to speak, in any way. Yeah, I'm familiar with those concepts from your book and have been fearful of falling into that trap. (laughs) So thank you for reminding me. I understand You have fallen in it, and there are likely several reasons why. If you listen to me here, you know that we have to go back to discover the reason why, because the reason lies in your subconscious, not your consciousness. Because yes, intellectually, you've read my book, you know what I'm saying, you get it completely. But it's not about your intellect, it's not about your conscious awareness. 
It's about your subconscious programming that is allowing you to continue to do the same thing, hoping for a different result. It's not about, you know, that ridiculous adage, insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. No, it's not about insanity. It's about our subconscious programming. And here's why. From birth to age seven, we are all programmed by our parents of what love is, the experience of love. It is unique to each one of us, depending upon several things. Our wiring as a baby and our parents in how they behaved toward us. So it's not about making them the bad guys. It's a combination of those two things. But we can't make any mistake about it, that the experience of an infant to about age seven, we are in theta brainwave state, which is the state we try to get adults into to hypnotize them. So everything that is happening to us from birth to about age seven, why we don't have many memories unless it's incredibly traumatic. And when I say incredibly traumatic, it can be seemingly small to an adult, but highly traumatizing to a child or very, very exciting, pleasant fun. For example, if you got to go to Disney World at age four and you ran into Mickey's arms or were on one of the big rides or looked up at, you know, Snow White's castle or whatever it was, I don't know, but you get the drift. That would remain in your memory. Glimpses of it, just snippets. But here's what happens. We must survive. And as infants, we only have inherent knowing of two things. One is how to suckle. And the other is that our survival depends on on those two people, typically, loving us and taking care of us. Most assuredly, the mother. Because if she doesn't pay attention, give affection, and give food and other caring, we cease to survive. It is that profound. So we learn with great nuance who we must become in order to get that love, because that love is our survival. That is programmed just like if we were to take you for seven years and hypnotize you. That's how profound it is. We are all running on that program unless we become seriously conscious and attempt to change it. I understand what you're telling me, yes. So how does that translate for you into what you are transferring onto Will? Well, I, I'm transferring an acceptance, I guess. I'm not sure. I'm okay. Not, I'm not sure. Yes. And until you are sure, you'll continue to do it. So there's something whereby, and this is extremely normal, typical, to one degree or another, we all do it. You are giving Will what he needs, what he wants in order to be loved, wanted, feel accepted, worthy, chosen. You likely had to do that in your baby mind in order to survive. So it's that deep. And why breakups or even facing a breakup is one of the hardest things an adult will ever go through when they have love that has been unrequited. And what I mean by that is that all things being equal, likely you feel so much more disquieted, uncomfortable with, pained by the possibility of this breaking up than you did with your marriage. That's very true. And it's disconcerting to me really because not only I had healed from the ending of my marriage before the divorce was finalized so I I did not struggle with walking away from it certainly there were challenges new challenges about the new lifestyle but I never missed it I never missed anything about that relationship this is this is devastating to me and similarly um, or relatedly I don't have any feelings of distress when I, I meet a new person uh, when we were not seeing one another and I was dating it didn't phase me at all to um, go out on dates and have them not work out or have a person who was interested or not interested in me. It didn't faze me, but this does. This really has a hold on me in, in a way that no other relationship ever has. And I, maybe it's because 
I think for the first time I allowed myself to believe that reciprocity was possible, that I could like someone as much as they liked me and it would be mutual and I wasn't expected to perform or fill a role. It just felt very natural, still feels very natural and that is very scary or to give up the hope, I guess I say, but I worry that hope, there's a fine line between hope and delusion and I worry that I'm dipping my toes in the delusional pool by um, hanging on to this. So um, you're right, intellectually. Actually, I understand this. I am still trying to figure out and unpack how it relates to me and my childhood, but I am starting to get it. What do you think you're starting to get? What are the connections between how you are being treated now or believed you had to do, shown you had to do, and very smartly adapted to what you had to do from birth to age seven? Because if you get that, you've got everything you need to know. And that's when the work begins. Well, I think that perhaps there's some people pleasing. There is some deeply rooted understanding that if I can contort myself into whatever another person needs or wants, that I can be safe or save the situation rather than focusing on what I really want and standing firm by it. It's scary to me to make any kind of request or demand. That is a a difficult thing for me to do. It's difficult for me to accept help and it's difficult for me to make requests and it's difficult for me to demand anything or or even hold firm on any of those demands. So I think that must be it. <laughs> There's the work. Yeah. Wiring that. <laughs> You got it. And you can. And it is a must. Because if it's not will, it will be the next guy that you actually really want. And most assuredly, when we have tremendous chemistry with someone, what that is, is our programmed experience of love meets their equal but opposite programmed experience of love. And ergo, a lot of chemistry. And I hear that you are doing one of the, that you are making one of the biggest mistakes you can make and that is intellectualizing why he does what he does and you are focused on him why he's doing what he does all about his psychology what's going on for him making excuses about his life and this the kids the that all of it and none of that will get you anywhere with him ironically none of it it hasn't and it will not. Well, I, I understand what you're saying, but I have not I haven't had that conversation with him. I've certainly not tried to diagnose him to him, but I understand that you're, I think you're telling me that I need to focus more on myself and fix myself before I can even consider um, having any sort of sustained situation or relationship. Well, I actually do not believe that. There is nary a person who is completely actualized over everything, completely set up and healed and all of that, then they can go into a relationship. In other words, it's not doing it on our own and then going and finding a relationship. It's doing it through a relationship. It's very easy with this analogy. If you were on a deserted island, would you know there's any work to do on your self about relationships. No. Exactly. If, if it's possible to, to do it through a relationship, and I understand that analogy of the desert island, because that exists, is it possible to work through this relationship? Or is it best to step away for a little bit? I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to proceed. I'm going to give you tough love, Logan. You don't have the relationship you think you have. Okay. You have not had anything for over a year. You are giving him the outs from all the conscious psychological stuff you have created in your mind that are the reasons. And I can tell you that it doesn't matter what they are because you can't control those and you can do nothing about them, but you can do things that will inspire him, possibly, to see you in the light he needs to see you in for the conquering, the challenge, the competition. But that goes against everything you've been programmed to do. Mm -hmm. So there will be a serious dissonance for you. You have to go against 
your subconscious programming. And the only way you can do that is by overriding your programming. This takes work. Because all that I give in terms of what we do with men, and it's a lot, that is the 20%. The 80% is who you become to inspire him to override whatever is going on for him. But I can tell you this part, that giving him more of what he wants, which you've been programmed to do to get your needs met, yeah, this has nothing to do with the intellectual person you are, the conscious person you are, the career woman you are, the mother that you are, the friend that you are, the family member that you are, none of it. In other words, our programming in this way has to do with our love interests. In other words, if we're a people pleaser, say, and you used that, you know, towards your programming, that in other areas of your life, through experiential knowledge and years in, you likely override in other areas very well. Work, advocating for your needs in terms of a customer service representative, your kids, your family. Now, sometimes everybody's on a scale, but if you were programmed with that, that the only way you got your needs met was by becoming what you believed your parents would need. And normally that is done through trial and error. And for everybody, it's different. For one person, it is looking the right way, always acting the right way. For another, it is achieving in sports, scholastics. It, it runs the gamut. Sometimes it's all of it. Others, it's simply being hidden so you don't make mom or dad upset. And it really is unique to each person. But until you go in and reprogram that, which you can on your own, and no talking about it will do it because you likely have someone in your life, either a best friend, a sister, mom, whomever, or a number of friends that you talk about it what's going on with him and why this is what it is and et cetera, et cetera. Is that true? Um, I do have a, a few friends who know about the situation. You're right. I have chatted them up about it, given them the broken record conversations. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work because it's just validating what is not changing you because life comes through you onto him and that change can change him. That's the only way. I, I wrote a note earlier before the call that said, how do I reset? <laughs> and I think this is what you're suggesting, reprogramming. If not with him, then with someone else. There is a possibility with him. Absolutely. But not in the way you believe subconsciously that it is, which is giving him what he needs and being what he needs, being there for him. With your parental figures, did you have to assuage their emotions, fears? Yes, certainly with my mother. And um, as you were talking, I was trying to figure out which boxes did I need to fit into and certainly was had very high expectations to be a high achiever and to be a rule follower without question. So I can certainly make some connections. So this is going to feel like love to you more than anything with a man who is giving it to you freely, who is there for you, who you do not have to become something for? Do you see? Yeah, one of the people that I dated um, in between was felt like too much for me because he liked me so much <laughs> that I had the ick, the ick factor. Very, very typical. No question. And that happens for so many of us. It truly is one of the reasons that, quote unquote, nice guys finish last. But it's not that he isn't nice. Will is nice. It's not that he isn't nice. However, he is self-serving. If you've been at all honest with him, and if he has a modicum of insight or intuition about you. He knows how I feel about him. Uh-huh. And he doesn't care. Well, it's been a few months, but I've always been honest, maybe at times way back, effusive, um, which is interesting because I've never been that way with anyone else. So I think when I started to be that way with him in the beginning, it felt freeing and good and comfortable. But 
I have pulled back on that. However, he does know how I feel. So that has been a concern for me or a wonder at least. Why is he allowing this to continue if he knows that it is not fitting into what I want? I can tell you. He knows he can. You allow it. Other women don't. I don't think there are other women. I don't think that he is dating anyone else. And I was a little buoyed up by the fact that he had not tried to move things towards sex. I kind of looked at that in the, you know, in the most recent times that we have been together. I kind of looked at that as respect. And I, I think I, in my mind, took up for him because I felt like he was not just taking what he quote unquote could. But I see what you're saying, that this situation works for him. It must give him something. And he is willing to continue with it, knowing that it's not fulfilling for me. He doesn't care that it isn't for you. He's getting his needs met. Mm -hmm. Because you allow it. I'm not making him the bad guy. You have not stopped it. You're an adult and he feels, okay, you're somewhat okay. And he doesn't think twice about it. Yes, I understand that I have, um, I've allowed it to happen. Uh -huh. And he will not see you or be inspired by you, someone to go after in the way he needs to if you continue down this road. I understand that. So I think, <laughs> I know I need to stop and pivot. And I've, I've heard you recommend writing an email or letters. I get nervous, and perhaps this is tied in with my programming. I get very nervous about anything that resembles an ultimatum. But I guess there's a difference between an ultimatum and a, and a firm boundary. Maybe that's something I need to really consider and reflect upon. There certainly is a difference. And I'm not suggesting that you do anything alone here, because if you do, it's going to create such anxiety for you and so much dissonance. You're not ready to do anything like that. I get that. This has to be talked through for you to have a much greater understanding than in one podcast conversation. And it takes work on your subconscious to get that assuaged and soothed. It's three things. Working on your subconscious programming to get to the point of doing what we need to do with a man behaviorally to inspire him to grow himself. You see, this is the ironic thing about people pleasing with a man and doing what he wants. You as the woman guide a man to his growth and you are stunting his growth, not only your own, but his, because it's like the old saying, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. <laughs> A man without a woman is like a fish without water. He will not grow beyond it. A man can only grow to the level of the woman who knows how to inspire it in the man. For him to have any chance, he's stuck. If there are no other women in his life, which I don't doubt you, I don't. I don't think that he does. And I think that this absolutely suffices for him. And it can for men because he can go about his life. He has the connection need confidant need, friendship need filled with you, and he can get his sexual needs met with porn, with masturbation, what have you. Doesn't need to have another woman. Now, when the kids are grown and gone, likely different, but right now that's the case, and he hasn't been inspired enough through it. And yes, he's only been divorced, you say, two years, three years? About three. Uh-huh. It's not been enough. He's still on the failure side of things and all manner of stuff, keeping him stuck. But the only way he's ever going to get unstuck is for you to get unstuck first, if he loves you enough. And there's a great foundation here. It's oxymoronic that giving him what he believes he needs and wants now will do anything to inspire him to change. Not going to happen. It, it makes a lot of sense. It really does. And, I, and one of the things that I have been remembering is a different energy that he had in the beginning when he was pursuing and how great it was to see him in that energy and how wonderful it would be to see him in that energy again. And I think you're saying that he's stuck rings true and that uh, I am as well and I need to take steps to inspire him. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, just need to push, push through the fear of changing things. 
but this conversation is motivating me to want to do that. That's great. Now it's going to be the how you do it because you need to do it in the right way to really set things on a path where he makes the change. And then you need support, A, by crafting the approach and then working on your subconscious along with it and then manifesting him back as you would like it because you can have it. But it really does take those three things in my book. And certainly when my clients have done it, they get it. It's work, but it is so valuable because of what it results in for the woman, the man, the relationship, both benefit. So I'm not just about the woman getting all that she wants and pulling the wool over man's eyes has nothing to do with that. He will be best in a full relationship with a woman. And you have to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are that woman for him. And consciously, you do. Subconsciously, you don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you become it, you will have it. So that's the manifesting part, right? It's all of it combined. It's not just manifesting. In other words, I don't believe that you can, without the other two components, meaning working on your subconscious and doing what we know works with men, that you can sit and imagine and manifest a relationship out of the blue. That's maybe my limiting belief because many manifestors would say, oh yeah, you can just think things into existence. Maybe that's that's true, but that's a long haul, whereby if you behave your way through changing your own self-belief, meaning your subconscious programming, and what we hear and listeners of this podcast call the mechanics of men, you can get it on the road and lead him to the destination you desire. When I say lead, it's not that you have a leash and you're pulling him along. That's not how it works. It's inspiring him to want to be everything for you and be with you along the journey. And I believe you can do that. All I'm hearing here is that he, to some degree, has been allowed and that has taken down his desire you can have it, but it's going to take real focus and work. And if not followed through in a way that continues to inspire him with you staying in a very good state and living in the knowing that you can have it, it is going to create an enormous amount of anxiety. And that we want to ameliorate as much as possible. I think that's true, that there will be anxiety However, I don't know if it will be worse than the anxiety that I'm currently experiencing being stuck in a less than ideal situation. So it's anxiety that will produce a positive change. If it is anxiety that will push a positive change, I, I'm certainly willing to mm -hmm. um, work through it. And I would like to feel like I did when I was almost surprised by his pursuit. It would be nice to recapture that level of confidence, I think. Yes. Seems like something that's a worthwhile endeavor for sure. Yes. I, I don't know what my next steps should be, and I guess that's where your, your um, programs come into play. Because you see, it's not just you. It's how he responds that leads us to the next step. You see, there are two people here. And it's not just, okay, go and do this and then it'll all work out. No, there's a bit of a time element. It's why I work where it's coaching weekly to do it, to get you ready. Then you set it in motion and then it's dealing with the natural anxiety that comes up, absolutely natural, normal, because everything in your subconscious programming is going to be screaming at you. You don't even hear it, but it's just going off in your mind at every moment, creating the emotional stuff and that, you know, everything you've been programmed to do and feel you would be going against. And that is very difficult on your own. Yes, but it would feel good to break free from old patterns that do not serve me. Yes, because whether it's with him or someone else, when I work with someone, it is very directed towards what you want because it's almost impossible for us to not go for what we want. It's the human condition. Our wants are our driver and very important to go with them, not against them. And it's through doing that that we actually change our emotions to whatever degree they will be changed. Sometimes there's a discovery that I don't really want this the way I wanted it. Other times 
And most of the time, it's someone getting back with a man, resetting it on the path of a real relationship. Because I have a question for you. Why is it you had to say you agreed that you, as the beautiful, wonderful 45-year-old woman that you are, the peak of her sexuality, should be in an asexual relationship? I don't want that at all. But you accept it. Accepted it as a means to an end. I guess I felt like I was building back or hoping that I was building back to a sexual relationship, but I'm not happy in an asexual relationship at all. It's not what I want. Um, and I did have a very fulfilling sexual relationship with him, and I was hoping that we were moving in that direction, but fearful that I was going about it the wrong way and potentially getting myself stuck, which I think this conversation confirmed. So it, it was good. I wanted to catch myself before I became a permanent resident of the friend zone, which I really don't want. I really would like to rekindle some of the great parts of our connection that we had earlier, but I would like to reset so that it has the chance of becoming a real relationship. And I think that the reason why I'm hesitant or I have been hesitant to allow anything to develop when I've dated other people is that I was very much caught up in the feelings that I have for Will. So it's difficult, I think, to detach from that and consider anyone new. That's one of the problems. And also, I have to say I get hesitant to get into a sexual relationship with someone because I don't really want a casual relationship. And I also am a little bit scared of a, of a real relationship, to be honest, just because I don't know that I have the capacity for it right now in this phase of my life. So I always tend to shut things down before they get to that level because I'm afraid of what the expectations will be of me. So yes, I have lots to work on. And I'm hearing that you can do it. I'd like to give it a chance and I'd like to give it a chance in the best possible way. And if it is not meant to be, it is not meant to be, but it would be good to give it a chance in the right way and give myself a chance really. Yes, because I think that, you know, when we do something, knowing that we really gave it a college try, as they say, really gave it our all and didn't just go on emotion and lack of information, etc., we can at least, if we must, walk away. We can feel much better about it because we really did all our due diligence. And then, yes, if it's not in the cards, it's not in the cards. But it makes us feel a lot better having done it in a way that we know also has the best chance of the outcome we want. Certainly. I, I would love to get your advice and the advice of people who, who've been through it, perhaps in the group. And I would like my next move or set of moves to inspire or evoke a sense of curiosity, as you call it, wonder in him rather than feeling shut down or cut off or defeated. I mean, I guess maybe a little defeat can be inspiring, right? But I want to maybe change things in a way that makes him want to lean in, maybe not at first, but eventually. Of course. So I'm hoping that that's what I can do. I do think there's potential. It would be worth seeing what happens for sure. Absolutely. So here's what I can give you then. When I hear what I need to hear on the podcast, I say goodbye to the guest and we then can talk for a short talk about what it's like to work together and what that entails, etc. Usually that's done within a week of this recording. In the meantime, I can give you this. Simply... Wondering what I'm going to tell Logan she needs to do to set things on the right path for Will and what she will need to work on for herself so that things work out for the two to be in a full relationship? In the rest of this episode, I outline exactly what Logan needs to be doing to lessen her anxiety and to create what she desires with Will so that both of them can move forward in a healthy and happy way. And because I want you to free yourself from what is holding you back from getting all that you desire and deserve. I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this episode with Logan, where I give her my full approach and coaching on what she needs to do from this moment on. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership only club of the Make and Wonder podcast, where you'll get over 200 ad free episodes categorized by age and relationship status, plus 
all new elite episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. Unfiltered coaching conversations like this one, with all my advice and principles to have you succeeding in your love life. The 8020 Wonder Club also includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace. Join monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a 6 or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me in a conversation like you just heard. You choose the date anytime during your 12 month membership and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve in your romantic life. Check it out at the 8020wonder.club and join us as that is the only way you'll be able to hear what I tell Logan she needs to do to begin to feel more secure and how this will help make Will feel inspired to want more. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have him wanting all that you do or how to start dating in a way that guides a potential Mr. Right to do right by you. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. That's T-H-E-8020 W O N D E R dot C L U B. You and your love will be glad you did.